Well, I invite you to turn in your pew Bibles to page 954 to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 13. Philippians 2, 1 through 13. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of the Lord. About 30 years ago, a song came out by Joan Osborne titled, One of Us. And some of you know the song well, Uh, some of you weren't even born. But the beginning of the song is this. If God had a name, what would it be? And what would you call to his face? If you were faced with him in all of his glory, what would you ask if you had just one question And what would you want to see if seeing meant that you would have to believe? What would you ask God if you were to narrow it down to one question? I read a post on social media from a person reacting to Osborne's song. I'd love to respond to him someday. He said this, God is great, yes, and remote, and completely out of touch He has no idea what we have to deal with on a day-to-day basis. He lives so far away, up on a cloud. What if he had to ride the bus to a little apartment and sit there all alone like an old man? Would life be the way it is if God was just a slob like the rest of us? Would things suck as much as they do if God had to walk a mile in our shoes? You know, we're in the midst of a series of questions. This series, uh, we're asking why questions. Why isn't life fair? Why do I need to forgive? Why am I here? Why do I need to trust in God? And today we come to probably one of the biggest questions of life, and that is, why does God feel so distant? Where is God? Why does God feel far away? It's one of the most common experiences, not just for those living on the margins, not just for those living outside of faith communities. It's, It's a feeling many of us have every day. Some of you are dealing with loved ones who are actively dying. Some of you are dealing with consistent health problems, setbacks that our challenges, ongoing challenges. Some of us have felt destitute, dry, desperate for a sense that God is still there, is still listening, that God still cares. But even our prayers feel shallow and empty, returning with an echo of defeat. I remember reading Job one time, and there's a line in the book of Job that 
leapt off the page for me, and it's in chapter 23 where Job says, oh, oh, that I might know where to find God. Who here hasn't felt that way? It's perfectly captured in C.S. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed. He wrote the book to cope with his wife's death. In the deepest throes of his grieving, he writes this, where is God? Hey, when you're happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing God, if you turn to God then with praise, you'll be welcomed with open arms. But go to God when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and then double bolting on the inside and then after that, silence. It's an honest question. It's an honest feeling. And this is one of the most recognized and celebrated Christians in the world. He had those feelings. Those who have gone before us, those who walk with us now, we've all been there. And like them, we need God's word to speak to us about this reality so that we might know how to persevere and wait with hope when God feels far away. I so appreciate Philippians 2. Many of you know it probably by memory. This is the Apostle Paul writing in 62 AD from a prison cell. Think about it. He's in chains as he writes to the faith community in Philippi. Before his dramatic conversion, the apostle was a man lost in religion. He was steeped in legalism. He was persecuting folks who were not Jews, who were not Christians. And once grace found him, he was dramatically changed, turned completely inside out. He was a new creation in Christ. The old had passed, the new had come, as we heard Pastor Matt say in the assurance of pardon. But the new life that he enjoyed in Christ did not guarantee a problem-free life. He experienced three shipwrecks, five beatings of 39 lashes each, three beatings with a Roman rod, a public stoning that nearly killed him, and no less than five imprisonments. This is the Apostle Paul. His is faith forged in the crucible of suffering and pain, who would later offer some comforting words to the folks like the Joan Osbournes and people like you and me, asking, why is it that God at times feels distant? But in our lesson for today, he offers hope in the great Christ hymn, celebrating Christ's life of unselfishness from pre-existence to his undeserved death to his exaltation. He lays aside the Godhead as he laid aside his garment. He takes on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And after humbling himself on the cross as he had earlier done by humbling himself, washing the disciples' feet, the scripture tells us that he is exalted to the highest place. And more than that, that every person everywhere will declare him as Lord and Savior. Philippians 2 is telling us that God is closer to us than we've ever imagined. That the eternal God did the unthinkable by putting on flesh here on earth. And not only did God become one of us, 2 Corinthians, the apostle says this, that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Who can make sense of that? The blameless and humble son of God didn't just come and then take on our sins, he became sin. The son of God became sin. He became utter shame. He became utter hopelessness. He became utter despair that we might be made right with God. That the church would live life together, the shared life, that we would serve in Christian love, that we would look out for the interests of others and care. I don't know if you've ever read John Steinbeck, but in 1954, he put out a really neat novel called Sweet Thursday. And it tells the story of a young prostitute named Susie who finds an opportunity to get out of the life that she is living. 
Steinbeck is accurate in depicting Susie as a girl of no self-worth, no self-dignity, because prostitution for him, in the way he describes it as a metaphor for the self-hatred and humi humiliation that it truly is. But in the novel, there's a breakthrough. Susie has a friend who comes to her, and it's a beautiful scene. As she's about to leave this destructive life, her friend says to her, now, go into the world, but first repeat after me. Say this, I am Susie and nobody else. And Susie looks at her friend and says, okay, I am Susie and nobody else. And then the other woman says, say, I am a good thing. And now with a little more confidence, she says, I am a good thing. And then she says, say this, and there ain't nothing like me in the world. And Susie begins to say, and there ain't nothing. And with tears of joy streaming down her face, she realizes for the first time, maybe ever, that somebody else knows her. Somebody else loves her. It's a beautiful picture in this novel, Sweet Thursday, of what the church can and should be doing. Not just with the church family, but with those on the outside. It's a, it's a tangible reminder that someone special has moved through our lives, that we've been touched by grace. The spirit of service is a spirit that begins because Jesus has moved in our lives. To be like-minded with him is to have the spirit of humility. It's to have the spirit of service. It is to know that we are children of God and that God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. And this is the same Jesus, the same son of God who calls each and every one of us brother, sister, friend. He says, you don't have to live in fear anymore. I am with you. Well, you can trust me because I will send to you the advocate, the Holy Spirit, who will remind you of everything that I have taught you. And I will comfort you. Just as God took care of Moses and the Israelites at Horeb, I will take care of you. So things aren't as bad as they seem. I would say to that guy in social media, actually God became one of us, just a slob, like one of us. He walked a mile in our shoes. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He showed us a better way and he died and he rose again so that we might live. And this is good news. Let's pray. Our gracious God in heaven, we give you thanks for this day and its beauty and for your word that is true and can be trusted. We thank you for Jesus who has come here to show us the way, who lived and died and rose again, that we too might be made right with you and serve you in all things in all ways. Help us to remember this grace that the old has passed, the new has come, and that we are yours forever, forever yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, amen.